Thank you for joining us. I'm Vicki Goodman, and on behalf of the Friends of the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior at UCLA and the Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital Board of Advisors, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's Open Mind program with Dr. Judson Brewer, internationally known thought leader in the field of habit change and the science of self-mastery and the author of the critically acclaimed new book that debuted at number nine on the New York Times Books bestseller list, Unwinding Anxiety. New science shows how to break the cycles of worry and fear to heal your mind. We are honored to have Dr. Brewer here with us today, zooming in from Hawaii, where he is teaching his classes at Brown University remotely. Note that twinge of jealousy in my voice. In a tweet that Dr. Brewer, who likes us to call him Judd, posted on March 9th, the official launch day of his book, he said, I'm looking forward to hearing how readers start using the book to break out of their anxiety and other habit loops and build better habits of curiosity and kindness. So here we are living through a pandemic, clearly one of the most anxious periods any of us can remember. And Judd is here to offer us a step-by-step -step clinically proven plan to break the cycle of worry and fear that drives anxiety and habits. Considering that it is estimated that over 284 million people worldwide suffer with anxiety, we are a very privileged group to have Judd here to share his knowledge and expertise with us. In addition to Unwinding Anxiety, Judd is also the author of the best-selling book, The Craving Mind, From Cigarettes to Smartphones to Love, How We Get Hooked and How We Can Break Bad Habits. He is also the Director of Research and Innovation at Brown University's Mindfulness Center and Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the Medical School. His groundbreaking work that combines over 20 years of experience with mindfulness training with scientific research has been featured on 60 Minutes at TED.com, the fourth most viewed talk of 2016 with over 15 million views, in documentaries, Time Magazine, books, and news outlets across the world. We are also honored to have with us Dr. Julian Bauer or Julie, as she likes us to call her, professor in the Department of Psychology and Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences at UCLA, and senior research scientist at the Cousin Center for Psychoneuroimmunology at the Semmel Institute, where her research focuses on mind-body interactions among individuals confronting stressful life events, in, particularly, in particular life-threatening illnesses. We'd like to thank both our scholars, Judd and Julie, for taking the time from their extraordinarily busy schedules to join us for today's discussion. Before we get started, just a few announcements and dates to remember. Our next Open Mind will be a special lunchtime program on April 7th at noon Pacific time, when we welcome from the UK, Simon Baron Cohen, Cambridge University professor and author of the new book, The Pattern Seekers, How Autism Drives Human Invention. He will be joined in conversation by Dr. Daniel Geschwind, director of the Center for Autism Research and Treatment at UCLA and professor of human genetics, neurology and psychiatry. Please visit our website, friendsofthesemmelinstitute.org to see a complete listing of all our upcoming programs. A few key dates, May 6th, 5 p.m., our inaugural Open Mind Film Festival for high school students for mental health, hosted by A.J. Mendez. And May 13th, 5 p.m., WOW 2021, our annual fundraising event. This year, a one-hour virtual program with Lisa Kudrow host, featuring luminaries from UCLA Health and Science and noted celebrities such as Dolly Parton, Ava DuVernay, Mindy Kaling, soccer star Landon Donovan, and Dan Wakeford, editor of People Magazine. And we're proud to have People Magazine as our media partner. This important event raises vital funds to support mental health education, 
research and clinical care programs at UCLA. A few housekeeping notes, today's program is being taped and will be available for viewing tomorrow on our YouTube channel, which is located on our website, friendsofassembleinstitute.org. There you will also find a library of videos from other past Open Mind programs, so please be sure to check it out. Today's program will run for one hour with the last segment reserved for your questions. If you would like to ask a question, please type it into the Q&A, which is located at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we will do our best to get to as many questions as possible. And now, let's give a warm Zoom welcome to Dr. Judson Brewer and Dr. Julianne Bauer, AKA Judd and Julie. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Welcome, Judd. Um, <laughs> you're joining us from Hawaii. And um, before we get started, I wanna share with our audience that I first um, had the opportunity of hearing Judd speak probably 10 years ago, something like that at the American Psych Psychosomatic Society annual meeting. And I was so excited by his presentation and the research he was doing, which is very relevant to the book, that I stayed up that night, designed my first um, mindfulness and neuroimaging study. So you, I'm sure everyone today is in for a treat because he's really a dynamic researcher and speaker. Um, so I thought I, you know, I had the, of course, the opportunity and pleasure of reading your book, which was fabulous. And I, as Wendy mentioned, you of course have written an earlier best-selling book, which really seems like kind of the first part of this book where we're really focusing on habits. And then this book is really extending that to anxiety. So I wondered if that might be a place to start. I'd be happy to start there. You know, a lot of my research really started from a very a personal interest in what the heck was going on in my mind. <laughs> you know, I started meditating at the beginning of medical school, my first day of medical school, actually, and had no interest in doing any research in mindfulness. It wasn't, nobody was even doing research, you know, back in the mid nineties, at least no published research really uh, was, was out. And so I was just interested in, you know, figuring out why I was so stressed out and whatnot. <laughs> And then, you know, fast forward <clears throat> the end of residency when I, um, I was actually at the end of medical school, I decided to pick psychiatry as my residency training because it, it fits so beautifully with what I was learning about the ancient Buddhist psychological underpinnings of what I was learning about my own mind. Uh, and, you know, people are telling me it was gonna kill my career. <laughs> <laughs> literally, literally. So the, um, you know, basically I started doing a bunch of research and just, it just was so amazing to see how this could help my patients with addictions. That was, you know, I'm, I'm an addiction psychiatrist. That's what I ended up really being interested in. But part of this was it helped me, it helped illuminate my own mind to see how many of my own addictions I had not seen before. And so it just seems, uh, it seemed like it was ready. This book was that my first book, The Craving Mind was ready to be written after I saw a bunch of connections between, you know, like all these types of addictions or, you know, that we, that we seem to have collectively. And, and I have, you know, it's basically a, you know, hi, I'm Judd, I'm addicted to thinking, I'm addicted to distraction, you know, I'm addicted to exercise, things like that. And, and that book very much uh, detailed a lot of the early work that my lab had done. It's a lot of the uh, early neuroimaging, as well as some of the clinical studies we'd done where we first found that lo and behold, you know, like mindfulness training was five times better than gold standard treatment at helping people quit smoking, for example. You know, I could not believe that we had results like that. And so, you know, we followed that up with, okay, what's going on in the brain? And we studied experienced meditators. And, and we started to see these connections that were just so beautiful where, where we could see, oh, there's this default mode network in the brain that's involved in self-reference and you know, oh, it turns out that that gets deactivated when people are meditating. And it turns out that the theory around mindfulness is to help people not get caught up in self-referential thinking. So it's like, oh, this is so beautiful to see that these fit together. 
And then, and this isn't in the book, but this came afterwards, we could even start to link all of those pieces together with smoking, for example, where we could deliver an app-based mindfulness training program. We could measure people's brain activity at baseline, and we could see strong correlations between a reduction in default mode network activity and people getting, you know, not getting as caught up in these cravings and how that predicted clinical outcomes. So it, you know, that first book was really all the kind of the theory behind all of this stuff. But I'll have to say, and you know, well, I'll just say it. Um, there, I got a I got a review on Amazon um, for that first book that was like a three star review where somebody said, "Oh, you know, he seems like a really nice guy, but he doesn't give us pragmatic, practical steps on how to do this stuff." And um, and so I actually ended up dedicating. Unwinding Anxiety to Amazon addicts. I don't know, I have no idea who this person is, but it really inspired me to say, well, okay, what are the pragmatic steps here? What's really going on here? And over the subsequent years after writing The Craving Mind, we were doing all of this work with like emotional eating and finding some really interesting results there. And then developed this Unwinding Anxiety app and we're getting really great results there. And I started to see very clearly both in my clinic and in our research studies that there was a pretty simple process that most people were following. Uh, and then after that, that's where it, it just seemed like all this research came together, all this clinical work came together, and then the story of how to work with our minds really unfolded. Uh, and, and a lot of it out of, out of serendipity. We can go into any of the details if you're interested, but that's, that's kind of where that evolution happened from, you know, first day of medical school, meditating to writing The Craving Mind to then writing Unwinding Anxiety. And so I think one of the things that was really interesting for me in the beginning of the book was this idea of anxiety as a habit. Yeah. Um, and I was, uh, that was striking to me and, and perhaps similar to you when I was reading it, I, I was like, gosh, I don't really think of myself as an anxious person, but, mm -hmm. you know, based on what Judd says, apparently I am. And, and so I was, you know, kind of wondering, like, if you can help us, how you understand how you define habit, how sure. do you think about anxiety as a habit? How do you find that? helpful in, okay. in helping to deal with it. Yeah. So I think of habits as you, you, the simplest way to think of them is the, what are the necessary components to, for anything to happen? So for a habit to form, you only need three elements, a trigger, a behavior, and a result. So for example, and this, this is survival, you know, this is like, you know, our ancient ancestors when we, they didn't have refrigerators, so they, they had to go find food every day and remember what it was. So they'd go out and they'd find some food. There'd be the trigger, they'd eat it. That would be the behavior. And then their stomach would send this dopamine signal to their brain that basically said, remember what you ate and where you found it. So it's, it's this process that's set up to help us survive. Same for you know, avoiding danger, right? You see the saber to tiger, you run, whatever. So any habit is formed through those three elements, you know, trigger, behavior, and a result. And it's really the behavior and the result that drive the formation of a habit. So if the result is really rewarding, we're going to learn it pretty quickly. Uh, and if it's not that rewarding, we might have to do it a couple of times uh, before it kind of sticks. So for example, you know, and we actually, I think of habits as really helpful for survival, not only, you know, the ancient ancestor piece, but also, you know, imagine if we had to relearn everything that we do every day you know, from walking to talking to making breakfast, we'd be exhausted, you know, by noon. Mm -hmm. So I think of habits as set and forget, but it's really that three, you know, trigger behavior result is really all you need to form a habit. So that's how we'd been approaching, for example, smoking, you know, stress, smoke a cigarette, and then get that brief relief. And we were targeting that uh, in the same way we could even target eating, you know, like you stress, you eat, and then you get that brief relief. But um, it was actually when we were testing our, our um, Eat Right Now app uh, with the, this eating app, somebody said, you know, I'm noticing that anxiety triggers me to eat. And she said, can you make an app for anxiety? And I was thinking, you know, anxiety is not really my lane. You know, I drive in the addiction lane. And, but it kind of, it kind of put a little uh, bug in my ear because as a psychiatrist, I was really struggling with helping my patients with their own anxiety. Uh, so for example, 
there's this calculation that you can do with any treatment to see how, how effective it is um, to just kind of give you a ballpark. It's called number needed to treat. So basically how many people you need to treat before one person shows a significant reduction in symptoms. And for a gold standard medication, that's 5.15, which means I have to treat five patients, over five patients before one person shows a significant reduction. So I was basically playing the medication lottery with my patients. And so I was kind of getting anxious myself, you know, with what, well, who's going to benefit and what do I do with, for the folks that, that are struggling that, you know, that aren't being helped by the medication. So here I put on my research hat and I said, okay, what am I missing? You know, what am I, how does anxiety actually work mechanistically, like from a behavioral standpoint and a brain standpoint? And it turns out that back in the eighties, right, this was when uh, the benzo, benzodiazepines were being prescribed like candy, right? Uh, the Rolling Stones song, Mother's Little Helper, right? She goes running to the shelter of Mother's Little Helper. That's benzos, right? So they were, they were writing songs about this because these things were being prescribed so much. No longer first-line treatment for, for anxiety. Uh, in the 80s, Prozac was developed and, and started, you know, SSRIs were starting to be marketed. And so people were really looking at medications for anxiety, yet, you know, 20% hit rate. So it turns out also in the 80s, people were quietly researching anxiety, like Thomas Borkovec and others. And they put forward this really interesting ass assertion, which was that anxiety could be driven like any other habit. And when I saw that, I was thinking, wow, that's interesting. Uh, and, and I was also thinking, oh, I know something about habits. <laughs> mm -hmm. Maybe I can apply what I know about habits to anxiety. And that's where we developed this, you know, that we, we developed an app specifically to target that mechanism of how anxiety is, uh, is driven as a habit. So the idea is anxiety could be the trigger, anxiety, fear, a thought, anything, which can trigger worry as a mental behavior. And I think that's really interesting because often we think of behaviors as you, you overeat or you smoke or you whatever, or you go on social media. But actually behaviors can be happening inside us and other people don't even know that they're happening. We might not even be aware of it because it's so habitual. The worry provides this reward, quote unquote, from a brain standpoint, because it makes us feel like we're more in control. So, you know, I like the example of if they, you know, if somebody has teenage kids and they and their kids just start driving, you know, and they go out with their friends at night and the parent stays up late worrying. I can promise you that worrying does not keep their kids safe. Sorry, anybody that I don't want to break the, uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, but, you know, it makes sense if you, if you say it out loud, right? My worrying isn't going to keep my kids safe, yet it gives me something to do. And so there's this reward there that then feeds back and makes us more anxious because when we worry, we can't get to sleep. So that's the basic idea of where anxiety can actually be driven through negative reinforcement processes. But of course, as a, as a researcher, I wanted to see if that was actually true. Mm -hmm. So we developed this, this unwinding anxiety app to see if we could actually target that mechanism and how well it worked. We did a study with anxious physicians. We got 57% reduction in clinically validated anxiety scores. And we said, wow, that's pretty good. Small trial, single arm. We, we did a second study that was a randomized control trial with people with generalized anxiety disorder we got a 67% reduction and we could calculate the number needed to treat. And that was 1.6. Wow. 1.6. So, I, I, so that's the basic idea. And it looks like, and we even went mechanistically, we looked at the mechanism. We can specifically target worry. As worry goes down with mindfulness training, so does anxiety. And so we can actually um, see mediated uh, mechanisms where we can see that mindfulness specifically mediates a reduction in worry which mediates a reduction in anxiety. And to me, it's great to see mechanism almost as much as it's great to see clinical benefit. You know, as a psychiatrist, it's great to see, you know, people benefiting. Um, so we're, you're jumping to mindfulness and maybe I feel like we should take people through the steps of the book, right? Sure. So sure. you have this wonderful metaphor um, of the gears of the bike. And so we start in first gear, right? We have to be, we're, we're mapping the habit loop. So in the way that you talked about, I wonder if you can walk us through that a little bit. And for me, at least, because I do research on mindfulness and have studied it for a number of years. So that part was almost the easier part, yeah. Um, yeah. but it was trying to get this idea of the habit loops that was I was struggling with a little bit more. So I, I'm curious to hear about 
you know, how you help people conceptualize that and how you see that as so basic to the rest of the enterprise. I would be happy to. So uh, I don't know. When I've been in LA, all I've seen is beach cruisers that don't have a bunch of gears on their bike. So, uh, so. Mountain bike. <laughs> We've got lots of mountain okay, bikes. Mountain bikes. Perfect. <laughs> so you can think of a mountain bike. Don't think of a beach cruiser. Mountain bike has a bunch of gears and first gear helps us get going, second gear and then third gear and so on, just like a car. And so I grew up mountain biking. So that's that's kind of the analogy that came to mind as I was working with my clinic patients and, and with these studies. And the idea is we've got to get going. And the place that we start is by just seeing how our minds work, by mapping out these habit loops. I'll, I'll give an example. And I write about this. So I use some clinical examples in my book. I had a patient who was referred to me for anxiety and he'd had anxiety for over 30 years. So he's about 40 years of age. His anxiety started when he was under 10 years of age. And uh, he came in, he said, he tried everything. He wasn't interested in medications. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm not, I was thinking, well, you know, why are you coming to see me? I don't know what I can help with. <laughs> But we sat down and I started taking his history and the way he described this so was that um, he would drive on the highway and he would start to get these thoughts that he was going to get in a car accident. I think his words were, I, I feel like I'm in a speeding bullet. And those thoughts became so distressing that he started avoiding driving on the highway. So you can see this habit pattern start to form. A trigger was this thought, the behavior was avoiding driving on the highway. And then the reward was that he didn't have those thoughts and he would also get panic attacks and things like that. So he could avoid having panic attacks. So he had, he had developed full-blown panic disorder and he also had full-blown generalized anxiety disorder, which had started way beyond, way before his panic. And he had no idea how his mind worked. So I pulled out a piece of paper and I just wrote on it, trigger behavior result. And I said, okay, let's map this out together. And so, you know, we wrote down, okay, thoughts and then avoiding driving on the highway. And then the, re the result or the reward is that you're not getting these panic attacks. And already you, I could see him, him start to open up and his eyes got a little bit brighter and he started to see, oh, this is how my mind works because I could show him that and then, or he could map it out himself basically. And then he could see how that avoidance was actually reinforcing that habit loop because he could barely drive on any local roads at that point uh, when he came to see me. So, so that's really what I think of as first gear is mapping out these habit loops. And in fact, it's, it's so simple. We've created a free habit mapper. It's, uh, it's the website's mapmyhabit.com. Anybody can download this. Anybody can, can map out any habit as a place to start working with their mind. So that's first gear. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I wonder if you, so in your clinical practice, and obviously you've got people doing this on your app, what are some of the common habit loops that you've seen and, and especially the ones related to anxiety because I'm trying to remember there were ones about worry one of my favorites was the self-judgment one but what are what are some of the common ones you've seen that are seem to be really important for sustaining anxiety you know there are a lot I'll name some that I've seen skyrocket over the last year because I'm guessing folks some folks can relate to these so one that I've seen is an increase in alcohol use so yeah. anxiety is the trigger it drives people to drink and then, you know, that drinking gives them that avoidance and then they come to get referred to me for alcohol use disorder or something, you know, because they're drinking too much. Another one I think many folks have at least heard of, if not um, can relate to is the, is the quarantine. It was the quarantine 15 and then the quarantine 20 and then the quarantine 30 as people are gaining weight. So I've seen a lot of stress eating where anxiety mm -hmm. leads to stress eating, which then gives them this brief relief. I, I've seen a lot of social media use increase where, you know, it's interesting, and I write a little bit about this in the book, our brains, um, getting information is a survival mechanism, kind of like when our stomach rumbles, it says, you know, you need calories, go get food. You can think of it analogously when there's uncertainty, our brain rumbles and says, go get information because information is food for our brain. So I've seen a lot of increase in social media use because people go to social media to get in news for whatever reason. <laughs> you know, not always the best news on social media, but I get it. Um, so people are going there. I see a lot of that binging on Netflix. Um, so those are just some of the examples. Oh, another one that I write about in the book is procrastination, mm -hmm. where you know there's a lot of procrastination, especially when people are at home. 
you know, people are saying to me, man, my house has never been cleaner, but I've never been farther behind in work, <laughs> you know, because they, they think about all the work they have to do. And then, like, oh, that's so uncomfortable. And they clean their house and, and they're procrastinating. And so you're seeing these as habit loops because so they're they're triggered by anxiety, uncertainty. Yeah. We engage in these behaviors, and they are not leading to our desired outcomes um, because too much, too often, um, too long, too long, etc. Yeah, absolutely. So if you think of worry, you know, does it keep our family safe? No. Does it fix problems? No. It actually makes our thinking and planning part of the brain go offline. Ironically. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't work. Like you're saying, procrastination, it's a no brainer. Procrastination doesn't work. Gaining weight doesn't actually fix the root cause of stress. Um, so all of those provide these temporary measures that can actually lead to other habits on their own that we then have to take care of. And I'm, okay. I'm shudder to say, or I shudder to think about whatever you, cause a lot of folks are like, okay, I'm going to just, I'm going to do this. I'm going to eat now, but when the pandemic's over, then I'm going to lose the weight boy, it's, we're, we're in for a lot of pain after this pandemic is over uh, with all these yeah. habits that have been formed. Yeah. So, okay, so we've got the habit loop. So then what's next? What do we do next? Yeah, yeah so often I see, you know, when people can map out their habit loops, they immediately say, oh, now I need to fix this, right? So one thing I'll say is <laughs> be careful. Uh, because often we're in this Western mindset of just do it, you know, the, the willpower based approaches. There's a, there's a skit that I love from the 70s from Bob Newhart called Just Stop It, uh, where this woman goes into a therapist's office, it's Bob Newhart, and uh, she says, you know, I have this problem. And he basically just leans over his desk and goes, just stop it, you know. And, and they go back and forth. With, it's, it's a hilarious skit. Um, you can, you know, anybody can look on YouTube, Bob Newhart, just stop it and you'll see it. But I think it's funny. That's, that's back in the 70s. And it's still funny today because that's the approach we take. You know, patient comes in, they want to quit smoking, just stop smoking. You know, just stop overeating. That's willpower-based approach. Just stop worrying. So I say the first thing is, as people start mapping out their habits, it's really important not to just default to, oh, I see it now, I just need to stop it. Mm -hmm. because, because stopping it doesn't work. Willpower is more myth than muscle. We, we can go into that if you're interested, but that's the first thing I warn people against is just because you can see it doesn't mean you know how to fix it. But <laughs> there is a simple fix and it actually comes through awareness. And so I think of this as second gear. And what is critical to know here, and I go into detail about this in the book, is that our brain actually sets up this reward hierarchy. So it doesn't just set up habits, but it also categorizes them. And it says, okay, if, you, if you're given a choice between two behaviors, I know which one is better, which is more rewarding. And so you'll autom I'll, I'll, my, brain, as my, my brain will automatically pick which behavior to do. So I don't have to relearn and rethink about this every day. So for example, if I'm given a choice between broccoli and chocolate, my brain's going to be like, chocolate, dude. But then if I, if I compare, you know, I actually have a very uh, nuanced chocolate hierarchy in my brain. It's like, I won't, I won't eat anything below 70%. And then, you know, 85% does have some cayenne, does have, you, you get the idea, you know. So that we have this reward hierarchy in our brain. And that's what actually sets up habits. Often we set these up early in life. You know, like for my patients who smoke, they tend to start smoking at the age of 13. So they set these, they set the reward value and then they forget about the details. So I think of it as set and forget. And that will continue until we actually change that reward value. We can't just say, stop eating cake because our brain says, dude, remember all those birthday parties you went to as a kid? That was fun. And you, you know, so we've got this reward value that's set up and we're suddenly fighting this very primitive part of our brain, this survival part of our brain that's saying, no, this is rewarding. I don't, so our thinking brain doesn't hold the candle to that, that emotional part of the brain that says, no, this is rewarding. So we have to go there. So that's what second gear is all about. And I'll give you an example, same patient uh, that I talked about that had anxiety. I, I also didn't mention, <laughs> he was about 180 pounds overweight. And we hadn't even addressed uh, his weight issues at that first visit. I took his history, knew that that was an issue, but we we're going to start with anxiety. So I'd send him home with our unwinding anxiety app in the, after that first visit. And I said, come back two weeks later and let's map out all your habit loops. 
and tell me what you discovered. <laughs> he comes back two weeks later. And the first thing he said to me was, Doc, I lost 14 pounds. And I looked at him because I, I was thinking, I swear, we didn't even talk about weight loss yet. And so I said, well, what's going on? And he said, well, I mapped out my anxiety habit loops. Anxiety was triggering me to eat. And that wasn't actually getting me anything. I knew that it was, you know, I needed to lose weight. So I was feeling guilty about that and it wasn't helping my anxiety. And I started to see that really clearly. So I just stopped doing it. <laughs> Literally, that's what he said. I just stopped doing it. And so what he was highlighting was that he was tapping into that reward value system in his brain. It wasn't about telling himself to stop overeating because he tried that, right? Didn't work. But it was about seeing very clearly what the reward was right then. Not only was he feeling guilty, it wasn't fixing the anxiety. And when he saw that reward, value very clearly, it decreased in his mind. From a scientific standpoint, this is called a negative prediction error, where our brain is predicting something's going to be X, you know, have an X reward, and it's actually X minus a bunch, you know, it's, it's less rewarding than we thought. So that's what second gear is all about, is helping people see very clearly right now, how rewarding the behavior is. Uh, in my lab, uh, I'll give an ex uh, example. My lab just had a paper accepted two weeks ago, I think, on, on this concept where we took our Eat Right Now app and we said, okay, how quickly does reward value change when people pay attention? Because as you might have noticed, all my patient did was pay attention as he was mapping out these habit loops. And he paid attention when he was stress eating and he saw that it wasn't helping. So he stopped doing it. So we, we created this tool that we could embed right into our app where people could use it as a guided mindfulness exercise, basically bringing awareness to their eating as they ate. Okay. So it's mm -hmm. an, as you eat, basically how rewarding is it? What we found, you ready for this? 10 to 15 times of people paying attention as they ate. That was the only instruction. We walked them through how to do that. 10 to 15 times we could model and watch their reward value drop below <laughs> zero, below zero. And then what did they do instead? They stopped overeating because they started to see, oh, it feels better not to overeat than to overeat. So there's an example of second gear, right? We can apply this to eating. We can apply this to smoking. We've seen the same things in smoking studies and we can apply this to anxiety. When somebody is worrying, they can ask themselves, what am I getting from this? Is this solving the problem? Is this keeping my family safe? Is this doing what I thought it was supposed to be doing besides just keeping me up at night? <laughs> Worry. It's not rewarding. I've never had a patient come in and say, doc, I want to thank you so much because now I see how great it is to worry. <laughs> you know? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so we have this awareness, but you can't tell me it's that easy, right? It's not like, oh gosh, like, uh, you know, worrying about my kids is not bringing them home. Like I need something else, right? So like, what else should I be doing with my mind to help me deal with the fact that my kids are still out there and I can't control the fact that they're not safe? Yeah, great question. So here, it's not just about helping our brain see how unrewarding the old behavior is, whether it's overeating or, or worrying, but it's helping them find what I call, and this is the third step, what I call the BBO, the bigger, better offer, okay? So I think of this falling into two categories. Uh, one is, you know, can we find a bigger, better offer that is intrinsic, or that is zero calorie, where you know, we're worried about eating too much or whatever, um, that is, that is that's always available. We don't become habituated to that. And I mean that because often uh, people are taught if they're anxious, they should distract themselves from whatever's making them anxious. So they'll you know, my uh, favorite example is going on Instagram and looking at cute pictures of puppies, right? So puppies are cute, mm -hmm. but our brains say, oh, that's a cute puppy. And then if we, we look at them a lot, our brain says, okay, I get it. You know, they're cute. Give me puppies and kittens, you know, give me puppies, kittens and babies. And we just have to keep upping the cuteness factor because our brains become habituated. That's how our brains learn. We, we, habituation is a normal thing, but there are a couple of things we don't become habituated to. And they are, curiosity and kindness. Thank goodness we don't become habituated to kindness, right? <laughs> uh, and they, they feel different than anxiety, for example. So anxiety feels closed or feels contracted, this tight little ball of anxiety, whereas curiosity feels open. Oh, well, that's interesting, you know, that type of thing. And you can't be closed and open at the same time. They're opposites. 
So what we can do is we can inject a little bit of openness into something that's closed and it starts to help us open up. So for example, if somebody is worrying, they can really explore, oh, is this worry actually helping me? And if they're truly curious, they can see that, that it probably isn't. They can also explore their body sensations if they're anxious. Oh, where do I feel anxiety most in my body? Oh, is it more on the right side or the left side? And just asking that question, oh, where is it? What is it? Where is it most in my body? Helps awaken that curiosity. And so we can start to unwind and step out of the old habit loop right in that moment. Same thing for curiosity. You mentioned uh, self-judgment habit loops. I see this yeah. all the time. We are really good at judging ourselves and also judging other people <laughs> in the West. You know, we're just, we've got judgment nailed. So we can start to notice what does judgment feel like? Does it feel closed or open? You know, it feels closed. We've actually done studies on this. My lab just did a study on this just to make sure that that was actually what people were generally uh, observing. And then what does kindness feel like? Well, kindness feels open and it also feels more rewarding than judging people. And so here our brains have this natural horror he already set up to say, you know, given if, if judgment and kindness are on the menu, I'm going to pick kindness because it feels better. Open states feel better than closed states. And so here, you know, it's not just about seeing how unrewarding worrying is, for example, that helps decrease that reward value, but then we can bring in a substitution behavior of curiosity, of kindness, if we're judging ourselves. And that combination, you know, that's, I think, where we're getting these gangbuster results with our, with our clinical studies, is it's not just seeing, oh, this isn't helping, but also giving our brains something that's more rewarding to do, and thankfully, is better for the world. Um, and so in the book, you kind of couch this under the general umbrella of mindfulness. So both curiosity and kindness are critical components of most mindfulness-based interventions. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and it's interesting because this is something we're really interested in in our work as well. And yeah, I was going to ask people. you about that. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. I was just thinking, so, you know, I'd love to hear what you're noticing with those. So we've done, you know, we work actually with a mindfulness intervention that was developed at the Semmel Institute in the Mindful Awareness Research Center by Diana Winston and her colleagues. So they've got a six-week mindfulness program. And it's interesting because it's, there's both practices of loving kindness, which you talk about in the book, but the, the as you're just as you're describing, the whole orientation of curiosity brings in a kinder state because you're no longer being critical of yourself. You're not like, why am I feeling this way? Why can't I stop worrying or eating or procrastinating? If you have a curious attitude, that breeds self-kindness as well. So it's it, there's an explicit and implicit, right? Mm -hmm. And at least for us, that that self-kindness ingredient has been really critical for explaining effects on depression, also explaining changes in the immune system that we see in our studies with breast cancer survivors. So yeah, so we've gotten very interested in these positive psychological states. And of course, you know, this is, um, there's a huge tradition of positive psychology interventions that are really trying to increase things like kindness and gratitude and other, other of these positive psychological states. Um, so and I, that, that actually leads me to a question, Judd, which I was like, okay, so do we need the first and the second gear or can we just like, can we you know, rush to the third gear and enjoy the bigger, better offer? Or do we, do we, is it, you know, kind of a critical part of your model that you have to really be understanding how these anxiety loops work as a beginning? It's a great question. We've seen a lot of people, even who've nailed first gear, try to rush the third gear and yeah. installs the car basically. So, mm -hmm. and it does that because they tend to get into this forced mode where they think, oh, well, if I'm worried, then I just need to be kind. If I'm judging myself, I just need to be kind to myself. But it's kind of like that old habit is just going to keep working in the background. And then the, the new one of being kind to ourselves can feel conditional, where if I'm worried, I need to be kind to myself, which then can become a habit unto itself. That's really different than simply comparing the two. What's it feel like to worry or judge myself? What's it feel like to be kind to myself? 
So when we can compare the two, then our brain is gonna pick one. But if we haven't seen or understood how the process works, then we're just, it's just gonna be a forced thing where we say, oh, I just need to be more kind to myself. You know, there was this whole thing uh, about 10 years ago, this positivity ratio. I don't know if you remember this, where it's like, yeah, I'd have three positive to every one negative thought. You know, it was, I won't go into the details, but basically it was debunked, you know, and they plugged college student diaries into a nonlinear fluid dynamics equation, probably, you know, and, and the, let's just say the methods were a little flawed, couldn't be replicated. It's not just about plugging in positivity. It's really about understanding how the mind works and letting the mind do the work for us. So when we try to get into third gear, it doesn't work. But when we simply bring awareness in, you can think of this as three gears of awareness. The first gear is becoming aware of the habit loops. The second gear is becoming aware of unhelpful the old habit is. And the third gear is becoming aware of how helpful or more rewarding the new habit is. So really this is about awareness as compared to doing anything because our brain has already set up the process for us. We don't actually have to do anything besides pay attention and make those connections. So one of the things that you, know, you talk about in the book and, and you mentioned today is that you've been meditating since you started medical school. So for many of us, we do not have years as a meditation practitioner, like do, our, do we have to go on these, you know, week-long silent retreats that you lead, which sound fabulous right now, or, you know, how much can we be picking up these techniques? And, and I know there's many clinicians also that tune in for these um, discussions. How can clinicians be learning how to use these techniques with their patients? I, these are great questions. So I just want to thank you for that. Um, here, part, part of the reason I wrote this book was that I wanted to help my own patients where they can, you know, they can meet with me 20 minutes for like once a month or something. That's not a lot of treatment. And certainly my, you know, I write about some of my patients who have done very well with that. But I love, I'd love for that to get out there, especially for folks that like to read books or, or like to use apps. For, for them to actually be able to see this process work. And so my hope with the book is not only can somebody learn about their own mind, but if, if somebody's a therapist or a clinician, the more they learn about how their own mind works and the more they learn about how the process of all of our minds work, the more they'll be able to not only empathize with their, their patients, but they'll be able to help them. And so the idea, what I hoped with the purpose of this book was to lay out everything so that people don't have to go on month-long silent meditation retreats to learn this stuff. Uh, in fact, one of our studies, and I'll, I'll finish up because I know we need to, we're, we're gonna move on. Um, one of our studies found that the informal mindfulness practices actually moderated results or the, the, uh, our outcomes more than the formal meditation practices. So we started designing our app-based mindfulness training programs specifically to start with these informal practices <laughs> And then layer in formal meditation practices that could help support that and create an even stronger framework there. So the hope is, you know, this is simple, but not easy, but it is, it is pretty simple. And so the hope is that anybody can use this and clinicians could also take this three-step process and, and start, you know, and, and help their patients. Great. I... I hate to interrupt this fascinating conversation. Um, and I wanna thank you both for giving us so much to unpack and process. Uh, but we do have a lot of questions from the audience that we'd like to get to. And several have asked if you could repeat um, the name of the website and the name of the app, Judd, that you had referred to. Sure, so the website is just drjud.com, D-R-J-U-D. And on the website, actually, we've got a bunch of free resources. We even have a free CME course for clinicians um, and also uh, links to all the apps. But the Unwinding Anxiety app that I mentioned is called Unwinding Anxiety. Uh, and there's also the eating app is called Eat Right Now. And uh, uh, the smoking app is called Craving the Quit. But they're all on my website, drjud.com. Okay, great. We had a number of questions about that. Um, we have a question about... Um, um, what the fundamental difference is between fear and anxiety and what happens if fear goes unchecked? 
Great question. Uh, and it's funny because I kind of start the book that way because fear is a survival mechanism. Right? So if we step out into the street and we see a car coming at us, we jump back onto the sidewalk and our brain says, oh, wow, you almost got killed. Learn to put your phone away and look both ways or whatever, you know, whatever causes us not to look, you know, look as we're crossing the street. So fear is helpful. Yet we can look at the time scale of that. So that fear response happens really quickly. After that, in a much slower process, we start thinking, oh man, I can't believe I almost got killed. You know, so I have a death wish, um, you know, or, or we keep re revisiting that when we're not actually in danger and we start to get, this, this is what builds up anxiety. So the definition of anxiety is this feeling of nervousness, worry, or unease about some, you know, something with an uncertain outcome or some, an imminent event. Well, we can actually make those events imminent in our minds when we replay almost getting hit by a car, even though we're not on the, you know, might not even be on the sidewalk anymore. So we can even actually develop anxiety by rehashing previous scenarios and projecting them into the future. So here I would say anxiety is really about this uncertainty piece and you know where where we're worrying and you know thinking of all these what if scenarios that spin us out into anxiety that is very different than fear both at if you look at it from a, a time perspective you know the anxiety lasts a long time fear generally comes up and if we're adaptive if we know how to work with it it goes away pretty quickly unless we're constantly in dangerous situations thank you um couple of questions about social media and the anxiety that that can spread very quickly um, in, in a moment that something can go viral. Yes. Comment about that. Yes, I think, so there's this term called social contagion. I also write about it in the book. The idea of social contagion is that an emotion can be passed from one person to another, just like a, say a physical virus can be passed from one person to another, yet, it knows no boundaries. So somebody can sneeze on your brain from anywhere in the world if you go on social media, right? That's how contagious anxiety is. And in fact, there was a study, I think it was published in Science Magazine a couple of years ago, showing that fake news spreads five times faster than real news. And so that fear, there's a, a real world example when our brain's going online to look for information, survival, but something is, is the fake news comes out and our fear mechanisms go off and then we automatically spread it to others because we're like, oh, everybody has to know this, this is terrible. So that's where social media can be very helpful for spreading information, yet it can be deadly in some real cases in spreading fear. Uh, we see this also with outrage, we see this with other things. So any emotion can really spread virally through the internet. Very interesting. Thank you. Julie, did you want to comment on that and the social media piece? I think just the only thing I would add and just thinking about the book, Judd, is how many people are using social media also as a distraction, right? Mm -hmm. And again, does that become a habit where you're, you're bored for one second and you just have this constant source of entertainment, information, et cetera? that typically, you know, at best is minorly entertaining. Um, I, I, I don't know, I mean, maybe it, I'm sure there's good uses of social media, but it can have this anxiety producing effect, as you say. And, and again, in the book, and you talk a lot about how it's one of these habitual behaviors that people may not be liking its outcome in their lives, right? Absolutely. Thank you both. Um, we have a question here that's along the same line about anxiety that's caused by addiction to watching the news on TV. I wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah, I will. And I think there's something unique about the news right now. So when I was, I grew up in Indianapolis, Indiana, I was a paper boy and I delivered the Indianapolis Star in every early in the morning. It was, that paper came out once a day. And if you wanted the news, you had to read the newspaper or you could watch the evening news, right? So there are a couple of news sources, but now the, you know, there's a constant stream of news. And what we can do if we're looking for information 
is, you know, we click on, our, on the new site, click refresh, see what's new, click refresh, see what's new, click refresh, see what's new, click refresh. And then we see a new story pop up and like, oh, there's news. Well, does that sound like pulling a slot machine, pulling a slot machine, pulling a slot machine, winning? Oh, I won a little bit. And then we get addicted to gambling. So on news has the same qualities, intermittent reinforcements, and it's not like news is doing this on purpose. They're trying to get the stories out whenever they come out, but they can't predict when there's going to be new news. So if we go online and we're constantly checking news, we're going to get this intermittent reinforcement that's exactly like a slot machine. So it can be very addictive, very addictive. Thank you. Julie, anything to no, add to that? Yeah, no, no additional comments for you. You've got the addiction expert here, so <laughs> it's great to hear his perspective. Um, we have a couple of questions uh, that deal with eating disorders. Um, one from a psychotherapist um, that works, uh, says, when you talk about how this applies to overeating, does this apply to something more severe, such as a severe DSM binge eating disorder? Yeah, interesting you mentioned that. I actually write about one of my patients with binge eating disorder in the book. And so binge eating disorder is a classic uh, make, uh, reinforced process. So for example, I'm thinking of one of my patients who uh, would, would binge on 20 out of 30, 20 days out of 30 days a month. So 20 out of 30 days a month, she would eat entire large pizzas in one sitting. And we mapped it out where her trigger was she would have negative emotions, her behavior was to binge. And then the way she described it was that she could numb herself. So that numbing was a brief relief that she got from these negative emotions because that's really the only thing she had learned to do. She started doing this when she was eight. She was about 30 when she came to see me. So with binge eating, absolutely, this is this fits you know, bullseye within this, this reinforcement learning paradigm and can also be addressed in the same way. Thank Vicky, you. do you mind if I just jump in with a quick follow-up? Oh, please. So we, we get to this question then, Jed, of like, who, who is at risk for these kind of behaviors? And certainly there's people who have traumatic experiences early in their life that are setting them up for, you know, depression, anxiety, substance use, et cetera. And I'm, you don't ex address that explicitly in the book. I know that there's other, you know, research on mindfulness that shows that it's actually a pretty good approach for people who have early life trauma. But I wonder how you incorporate that into your work. Sorry, sorry to take over your question, Vicki. <laughs> oh, these are questions from our audience, yeah. so yeah. please. Yeah, this is a really important question. It's one that we are just beginning to study ourselves. So for example, I think some of the most solid data that I've seen around adverse childhood events, so ACEs, uh, there are these growing number of really convincing studies around you know, the more adverse child event, childhood events that people have, the more likely they are to have these things that you're, you're talking about, Julie. So here, we haven't specifically looked at that in either a bunch of ways we could. We could you know, look at this as a predisposing factor. We could look at it as you know, with folks with adverse childhood events, are they more likely to benefit from mindfulness practices because they've got these higher risk factors and they're already way up here, whereas other folks may not be you know, as high in anxiety, for example. So my hypothesis would be that folks could benefit as long as the mindfulness training is, is delivered in a trauma sensitive manner. You know, so I think yeah. that's really important uh, that, that that's addressed. One reason that we haven't, uh, we haven't looked at that ourselves yet was that one, this general process is applicable to everybody. And so unfortunately, a lot of people have had adverse childhood events, yet not every, thankfully not everybody has. So I wanted to start with the broad to see what, how much of a population health in, impact can we make? And then we can zoom in more specifically with these specific questions once we've identified common mechanisms. So everybody learns through reinforcement learning. Can we then, if we know that, then we can say, okay, can we take this and look at subpopulations like folks that are more at risk, like folks with adverse childhood events. So my, I actually have a graduate student that's very interested in looking at this. So hopefully we will get to look at this more in, in the near future now that we've started to get you know, replication in our studies, for example. Julia, any other? 
it, it's sure. something we're very interested in because we know that early life stress, you know, sets up your brain and your immune system in ways that then have repercussions throughout the lifespan. So we're, we're really interested in mindfulness as a potential intervention for targeting that. Thank you. Um, we have a question here um, from a first responder. Um, how do you deal with the chronic trauma of the pandemic? After one year, how do you suggest the first responder can cope? That is a great question. Uh, so I, I'll say, so we did a, we did a study BC before COVID-19. So it seems like ancient history. <laughs> We did a study with anxious physicians. I think I mentioned it briefly. And one thing that we looked at that I didn't mention was that we looked at burnout for them because we had a hypothesis that anxiety would be correlated with burnout. And people have written theoretically about that, but nobody had actually done a study that we could find that linked the two. So we looked at physician anxiety, we looked at burnout, and we found that certain aspects of burnout are highly correlated with anxiety. So then we treated them with, for their anxiety with our own anxiety app and we got this 57% reduction in anxiety and we got a 50% reduction in callousness. We got a 20% reduction in emotional exhaustion. Those were the two main subscales we looked at. This is a mad black burnout inventory. And so we could see where there are things that are correlated. If we can train people to work with their minds, then that, that knowledge generalizes to wisdom because we didn't mention burnout in the program at all. Yet they were learning how to apply this to other aspects of their lives. So I would say for first responders, um, first off, I, you know, and I say this with all sincerity, like my deep, deepest gratitude for all the work that you do. And I say that partly because I want you to remember that. It's, it's really important to see what it's like to remember all the good work that you're doing because that feels good in itself. You know, that's rewarding. That's what gets me up in the morning as a clinician. And as, as a first responder, I was, I was briefly an EMT in college. Um, often people, they're, everybody's in a rush. And so they're, they, you know, everybody just ignores the fact of what you just did <laughs> to really help people. So I would start, I would say, just let that sink in just in terms of, and not, this isn't like a pat, you know, pat yourself on the back. This is just what you do. So I would start there. And then I would also say, you know, see what it is that is adding to, if you're having any burnout or struggling, see what it is that your mind might be doing habitually that's adding to it. Okay. And that's where you can work with it. So there's just, there's just going to be, you know, adrenaline rush when you're called to a scene and you don't know what's happening that's part of the gig but the idea is how resilient can you become can you um can you work with that and let it go and that's you know what julie and i've been talking about today is these three steps can help people see these processes and then also know when it's adaptive like a fear response and then know when it's an anxiety response let the anxiety response go unlearn that but then have that fear response do what it needs to do to keep you and other people safe so I hope that's helpful. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, I want to thank you both so much. You've given us so much to think about and incorporate into our daily lives. Um, everybody should read Judd's book, um, Unwinding Anxiety. And um, we are just very fortunate to have you here today and Julie. And thank you for the time and sharing all your knowledge with us. Um, I wanna thank everybody that's tuned in. There were 760 people on this Zoom. And I um, wanna thank everyone that participated and hope that you'll join us again. Um, our next Open Mind is on April 7th. It's at noontime, which is a very different start for us, but it's because Simon Baron Cohen lives in the UK. So we are going with, with the UK time zone and um, we hope we will see you all then. And thank you again, Judd and Julie, you're a great team. <laughs> Thanks thank so you. much. Thanks Vicki. Thank you. Bye Judd. Take care. Bye.